Okay, this is a brief presentation on James Carey's essay, A Cultural Approach to Communication, and his theoretical model of transmission and ritual models of communication. As you can see here, transmission can be understood as the exchange of information, whereas ritual communication involves the expression of group identity. Transmission and ritual are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but different ways of focusing on different aspects and types of communication. A, a single communicative event or practice can have both transmission and ritual elements. But what exactly do those mean? So Carey's transmission view, he says, is the most common view of communication. And this is the idea that communication is the transmission of signals over distances for purposes of control. Well, now that sounds kind of nasty, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. If I communicate to you that it is raining outside and you should wear an umbrella because you might catch a cold and get sick, um, that's well-intentioned and, and good information. But I am trying to exert my will and my desires over you. I want you to use an umbrella and not get sick. I want you to do what I want you to do, and that is a form of control which requires communication. And the roots of communication in this view, this root of transmission communication, why we do it, is in order to exert our willpower. This is the model that you most frequently see in introductory communication textbooks with the sender receiver, sender message receiver model, which gets um, expanded upon with things like medium and channel and feedback. Uh, you might see it in a circle with encoding and decoding, uh, but it all is sort of based on this mass communication model that you see below that of, uh, of an electronic signal being sent from a camera to a broadcaster to a server to the viewers um, and applying that sort of mechanical model to both mediated and um, interpersonal communication. That there is a signal, that there is information, that there is data, that there is a message that goes uh, from one place to another. So uh, ask yourself if you're working on trying to understand this essay, perhaps studying for a quiz or an exam. What examples of transmission communication does James Carey specifically mention in the essay? Also, what other examples can you think of? If you were presented, if you were asked to provide an example, what would you say? If you were presented with um, a type of communication or a communicative event or practice and asked to say whether it was primarily transmission or ritual, would you be able to do that? Now, the transmission model makes certain assumptions about the relationship between communication and reality. So the transmission model assumes that we live in a real world of objects, events, and processes that we can observe. And yes, we do. Carey is not saying that one of these models is right or wrong. What he's saying in this really famous and influential essay is that communication scholars tended to focus on the transmission model and had been neglecting ritual types of communication. And he's trying to give us a vocabulary to talk about the differences between the two to understand these assumptions that are built in the two so that we can better describe the type of communication we're interested in and we're studying. So in the transmission model, like I said, there are certain assumptions about reality, this real world of objects. And yes, we do live in a real world of objects. However, that's not the entire world. Yes, we live in a world of umbrellas and rain and rainstorms and processes of getting colds. But we also live in a world of things like love and family and gender, and race, and hope, and faith. Things that are very, very real, and very, very important to us. Often, the phenomena in this social world are the most important things in our lives. But they're not necessarily concrete objects. They're not necessarily um, things that we can observe or put underneath a microscope. Um, we can observe the effects they have. We can observe things that we associate with them or things that we do in their name. But I can't put love under a microscope and I can't connect wire uh, between uh, a wire from one piece of love to another piece of love in order to transmit it from one place to another. 
But in the transmission model, that's the way things work. And for that to work, it also assumes, number two, that language and symbols name these events in the real world and create more or less adequate descriptions of them. You can see below a variety of uh, linguistic, symbolic, photographic, auditory representations of a cat. Uh, for you to understand those, the sender and the receiver have to have an agreed-upon understanding of what a cat is and what these sounds or symbols or images uh, that they connect to the idea of cat. Again, this works in the concrete world pretty well. Not always. There's a few bumps, but pretty well. When we get into the social world, things like, again, love, family, gender, it gets a little bit more complicated. You can, we can say the word masculinity, and I have meanings and understandings of it, what it means to me, things that I think are masculine or aren't masculine, um, but each of you could think something completely different. And it gets even more complicated when you move into other uh, cultures and societies and time periods. So the transmission model kind of really requires that there's a uh, stable and consistent meaning associated with language and symbols. So it assumes that there is a reality, and then, after the facts of it, our accounts, our linguistic and symbolic descriptions of the things and processes in reality exist and are stable. And this, in turn, assumes that there is something called reality, and then something else that's not reality. Call it fantasy or unreality, but the transmission model kind of makes a distinction between the two. Okay, so again, think, ask yourself what kinds of communication or communicative events fit well with this model. Um, one hint is that the transmission model is about exchanging information. And within the idea of information is the idea of newness. The first time I tell you something, that's information, right? It's raining outside. That was a piece of information. Maybe you didn't know. Once we've communicated it, I don't need to tell you again, right? Unless you're forgetful, which I can be sometimes. So, you know, but ideally speaking, I don't need to tell you it again and again. So the transmission model usually just needs to happen once or twice until the information has been successfully exchanged. You need a new piece of information that you did not already have as a receiver in this model. Now, uh, I'll say it again, uh, transmission and ritual are not mutually exclusive, but they are emphasizing different aspects of communication. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, but just remind yourself that it's not necessarily that things are one or the other, but they are largely examples of one or the other, or there are ways we are emphasizing different aspects of something. Okay, so the ritual model. In the ritual model, communication is a symbolic process where we're actually creating, producing, repairing, and transforming reality. It, the ritual model involves values and identity and things like that when we perform acts of communication that express our belonging in a social group. By doing that, we create the social group, we maintain it, we reinforce it, we transform it, we change it. So this isn't about imparting information. This isn't about newness. You can see some examples here of expressions of both um, gender and race with these Latino women, right? And these expressions of their identities as Latinas, uh, whether it's through fashion, dance, celebrations like a quinceanera, language, um, music, are are not. It's not information. Once a new, new person knows that they're Latina, they don't need to be told again. And the members of the same group certainly don't need to be told that. But it's a way that they affirm and assert and express and maintain the bonds of their social group, right? It's creating what Latina is for them at this time and place. They're expressing the shared beliefs and values of their gender and their race and their culture in these activities. So ask yourself again, if you're studying for an exam, what kinds of examples of ritual communication does James Carey offer? And what other examples can you think of? As with transmission, the ritual model has some um, assumptions built into it about communication reality. One is that reality is not given. And, and let me clarify, this is social reality, right? We're not talking about umbrellas and rain and rocks and concrete, things like that. We're talking about things like love, religion, gender, race, 
things like that, social reality. They're very, very real, but they're not concrete and they're not a given, right? There's, there's not, uh, it's not written in stone somewhere what it means to be a woman or what it means to be um, feminine or what femininity is. We see some different examples and representations here on this slide. Femininity, reality, social reality, is brought into existence. It's produced by the construction, apprehension, and utilization of symbolic forms. We use symbolic uh, communication, expressions of symbols and representative activities in order to create the meaning of femininity within a per particular culture and society. So reality is therefore not a mere function of symbolic forms, but it is produced by humans. We create social reality through the ritual model of communication. So again, ask yourself what kinds of communication or communicative events fit well within the model. Since we're not talking here about information and newness, a key is often um, expression or repetition. When you do things again and again, particularly within a specific group, you're not imparting any information. And that suggests that it could be more of a ritualistic form of communication with that social group. Okay, finally, like I've been suggesting, remember that this isn't a situation of either or, that it is um, that something, a, a, a form of communication, a communicative act, a communicative practice is exclusively transmission or ritual. Um, often, most often, there's a little bit of both going on. What Carey gives us is a model in order to, to um, filter or emphasize or make distinct one or the other, kind of like the red or the blue lenses on this woman's classes. Um, we want to differentiate between the two, and then we want to be able to say this is the kind of, when I say communication, I'm talking about this kind of communication. I'm talking about transmission, or I'm talking about ritual, or in this particular act of communication or communicative event, I'm interested in the transmission aspects, or I'm interested in the ritual aspects. So, for example, here we go. Think about the cultures of Clemson. What forms uh, what communicative acts have transmission elements and what aspects of them are ritualistic. And you can start right here, looking at this example of uh, me in a Clemson cap. On one hand, the information could be, I am a Clemson fan, or I go to Clemson, or I have some particular affinity of Clemson. Once you see that, once you know that, that information has been transmitted. That is transmission communication right there. However, the ritualistic aspect is every other time I wear the hat, or I wear a Clemson shirt, or I'm at Clemson wearing it, or other people are around me wearing it, right? That repetition that is part of expressing belonging in the community and cultures of Clemson. That is the ritualistic aspect. So reflect upon, think about, ask yourself, discuss with each other, what are some other ways at Clemson that we participate in transmission and ritual forms of communication? And then maybe ask yourself the same question about other cultures or communities that you belong to.